So I wanted to begin with something that I was only able to find out about and indeed do res archival research about because of this grant, and indeed um, that I would not have considered uh, at all if it weren't being prompted by the question of wisdom. Because um, I think indeed part of the answer to the question we were talking about in the last session about what is the utility of defining, have, I invoking wisdom whatsoever in no small part comes from the way that it challenges our disciplinary approaches to things. Now, the picture I have uh, up here is a, is a device in the Museum of the History of Science at Oxford. There's one in the Science Museum. And it is the logical demonstrator of Charles Earl Stanhope. It's a pr pr production of the late 18th century. And it's a pretty silly device that essentially does something like a Venn diagram, but for which its inventor thought it was going to be a transformative moment in human history. It was going to be a transformative moment, he thought, in a very classic Enlightenment style, because finally there would be a device that could be used to regulate human reasoning in all affairs. Now, so far so good, but I discovered a document in which he talked about what ought to be our reaction to it. And he says, the mechanical instrument will show man in what consists his boasted faculties. It will cause him to perceive the weakness of his nature. The consequence of all this, he says, will be to weaken self-conceit, to lessen pride that baneful canker of the human mind. Now, I haven't quite figured out what to do with this. But what I find extraordinary is that you have simultaneously um, a device which is an illustration of the hubris of the European Enlightenment. <laughs> the hubris of reason. And this is being produced in the wake of the French Revolution, for which the inventor was the only supporter in the House of, House of Lords. He's a very interesting guy. So simultaneously it's about the hubris. And yet, it's deeply caught up, not only with epistemic transformation, both a profound affective transformation, an affective transformation that was still seen to be necessary. Now, I bring this up because just like the question of wisdom, this device puts a little bit of pause in the great fundamental sort of meta-theoretical shifts around the question of wisdom in the French Enlightenment. Now, just to remind you, my study is focused on what is the relationship between mathematics and wisdom in the sort of long European Enlightenment. And it looks at things from two points of view. On the one hand, I'm interested in the extent to which mathematical practice itself was regulated by some set of demands about applicability to the world in some sort of way, either physical or also moral and affective. And this actually goes quite deep into the history of, say, partial differential. I talked about that two years ago. Last year I talked about the other side of my project, which is mathematics as a model or as also as a practice necessary for an instantiation of a new kind of museum. And I've been pursuing this focus as a way of not so much undercutting our standard narratives of enlightenment, but to look at them in a very different, in a very different way. Now, Along the way, I did something deeply unwise, as one often does, and that's agree to review a book. And so I ended up writing an extremely long review. And the interesting thing about the book is it really challenged me to, to, to be able to defend the, own, the kind of history I was writing. The book had a sort of very simple-minded, in some sense, thesis. The claim was that the transformation from traditional models of wisdom, that is, knowledge of the good and the expert with the knowledge of the good, to knowledge of the goods was simply a product of emergent capitalism in the Netherlands. There's a lot of problems with this book. It's not a good way of arguing, but it's an extremely, it, it, it pushes us, I think, to think very <laughs> concretely and honestly about what is the the economic and social transformations that undergird the abandonment of a traditional consensual model of wisdom towards the sort of disciplinary confusion 
in which we find ourselves today. And what I think is useful for us in thinking about uh, the Enlightenment, the end of the Enlightenment, is that you see in something like this text, um, something like the confusion, the productive confusion that we're talking about today. That is, we have no set definition of wisdom, and yet it's enabling us to think through, um, to think through uh, some connections in a very profoundly different way, to get away from merely an epistemic view um, to something very different, to struggle, as did the people uh, in my study in the Enlightenment, to find what are going to be the replacements now that we've abandoned a transcendental metaphysical, we've abandoned a certain kind of epistemic model of, of the wise person, and indeed, in many cases, we've simply abandoned the wise person for some kind of impersonal wisdom. Okay, thank you.